morning and welcome to Flashpoint. I'm Kimberly Gill in for Devin Skillion this week and what a week it has been. Just when you think it can't get any worse or any more controversial, it does. What began as a protest against the removal of a Confederate statue in Charlottesville, Virginia, ends in violence when a car barreled into a crowd of people, killing a 32 year old woman. And the president of the United States says both sides are to blame. After sharp criticism, the president backed off those comments in a teleprompter prepared speech only to backtrack to his original remarks later. Remarks that were praised by former KKK leader David Duke. It's also been a week where we've seen corporate CEOs quit a White House advisory council after the president's remarks. We've seen Confederate statues dismantled and our president calling it sad and foolish to rip apart history and culture. Even Republican senators are now calling the president out on his comments. Years from now, I think when we look back at the history of the Trump presidency, this past week will likely be seen as a turning point. But why and why now? It is an uncomfortable discussion for many, but it's one we need to have. And we're talking about it this morning on Flashpoint. Just a little disclaimer before we start this morning. Flashpoint has never shied away from discussions on race or religion. In fact, those subjects are essential to the show's DNA. We have a long history of tackling topics that can be emotional and contentious, and we always strive to have a reasonable, nuanced debate. That is what we hope we'll have today. We have assembled a roundtable to do just that. Stephen Henderson is the editorial page editor at the Detroit Free Press and a good friend of the show. We also have with us Lena Epstein. She served as the co-chair of Donald Trump's presidential campaign here in Michigan and happens to be running for U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow's seat in the 2018 election. We also have Kim Trent. She's on the board of governors at Wayne State University and policy associate at Michigan Future Inc. And you all know my former colleague and now host of the Guy Gordon Show on WJR every afternoon from 3 to 5. Guy Gordon, thank you everybody for being with us and uh, here on this Sunday morning. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah, the thank door key you. still works, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this week, man, what a week it has been. I think a lot of people are, are kind of at their wits end, at the end of their rope, you know, as... as Unsteady as the president seems with his remarks and everything that has happened over the week, why do you think he persists in this sharing blame narrative even after so much backlash over this past week? Guys, start with you. Well, I think there's a healthy argument going on. By the way, it's been it's been the weirdest week in talk it, radio. And Frank Beckman's been at this for a long time. He says he's never seen it this yeah, crazy. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you're you're not wrong, and it's presuming that going into this. The sh look. The, the, the arguing over how much blame to assign is one of the most pointless exercises in the world. But we need to acknowledge, if only from a law enforcement standpoint, that there is blame to be had on both sides. Mm -hmm. That there is, and in fact, Cornell West was quoted about this in the, in the Washington Post and the New York Times. There were anarchists in this Antifa group and they are hell-bent on, on violence. So we need to have that discussion, if only so we understand that where the threat lies. Uh, but I, no, the, the, the blame game, th there needs to be an assignment of that. Now why the president, after already going down the one road and being bashed, revising his remarks, something that is refreshing to see him do, mm -hmm. and then backtracking, doesn't make any sense. I have a theory. Yeah. <laughs> um, the president is a bigot. <laughs> The president has been a bigot his entire public no life. life yeah. um, this is a person who was sued by the Justice Department for not renting to, to African Americans and then resued because he continued to do that. This is a person who was on the wrong side of our modern Scottsboro Boys um, case here in, in New York City when we had the Central Park Five. That was basically a reenactment of what happened in Alabama in the early part of the 20th century. Um, on the wrong side of that, took out a full-page ad calling for the execution of people who were found innocent. And even when they were found innocent, he said, well, they did something. Mm -hmm. As recently as last year. We're not talking about something he said 15 years ago. Um, this is a president who has a track record of being racially insensitive, a misogynist. Um, at the very, at the very least, um, we know he has family members who are Jewish, but that doesn't stop him from saying things that have been anti-Semitic. This is a person who, um, Maya Angelou is kind of a cliche now, but she said, when someone shows you, tells you who they, they are, are, believe them the first time. And you believe this is who I have is? believed him since they, the 80s, so this is not the, surprising uh, Obama to me. Obama birther campaign, which oh. launched him into 
his campaign for the presidency, that it was absolutely rooted in the idea of otherness mm -hmm. uh, that was assigned to the former president. And no so doubt about it. One, one of the big problems that we have right now is this effort to sort of dissociate him from the larger context of this issue, which is that you still have a nation that's built on fundamental inequalities, mm -hmm. uh, systems in place that enforce those inequalities, and when you side on, when you take the side of those systems, when you take the side of the people who believe in those systems, you're as racist as they are, and there's not another. There's not another way to sort of soft pedal that. But here's my thing: Do we think we are seeing more racism, more hatred now? Why now? Uh, I'm from the South. I feel like this thing has been going. This has been going on since I can remember. One of my uh, big rivalry high schools. Um, they're the Mid Carolina Rebels. It was nothing to have rebel flags all over this school. Why now? Why is it such a big deal now? Is there more hatred now, Lena? Do you think? I, I can't speak for what happened oh, longer than 36 years ago, but I can say in the you 36 are an, years. A millennial. You are I am a millennial. In the 36 <laughs> years that I've been alive, I've never been more concerned mm -hmm. about the future of our country. Let's just let's just take a step back and and agree that we might see ideologically differently, and that's one of the beautiful things about this country. We are protected by free speech. We are protected by civil liberties, and I am deeply concerned as a citizen, as a wife, as an expectant mother, as a candidate for United States Senate, the level of divisiveness. To me, that is the underlying story. Let's be very, very clear. Mm -hmm. The Republican Party is the party of Lincoln. We stand against the KKK, we stand, I am a Jewish woman, a Jewish woman in the Republican Party. My grandfather, Stanley Winkleman, marched with civil rights activists in the 1960s. This is the opposite of what we stand for. And, and speaking of what you stand for, I saw that you were at an event in Howell, which by the way, when I first moved here, I heard ter terrible things about Howell, it being you know, notorious for uh, KKK rallies in the past. There was some big meeting there. What were people saying there? It was a rally for President Trump, and as somebody who was in the room, uh, I can tell you firsthand as a participant that the first thing that occurred was the denouncement of KKK white supremacy and the fact that the Republican Party and the president do not stand for that. And let's be very clear, I would like everybody to be in these rooms before we speculate, my friends. If you weren't in the room, I will tell you as somebody who was that this is a group who denounces white supremacy. Guy, you've been pulling double duty this week on the radio. Mm -hmm. um, you've said that you are seeing a schism in the in certain well, conservative political And, and I want to take it, it also tap Kim and, and, and Steve for a reason here. And that is, um, I've been called a white supremacist this week and also a liberal. I think <laughs> you guys know me, and I don't think that you would agree that <laughs> neither tag applies. Okay, but that's the kind of a week. That, <laughs> thank you. That's, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of week it's been. But, um, you know, we, we do have a problem here, and that is Trump loyalists are saying and they're saying to you look he came out on, on Saturday and he said I condemn all race racism bigotry and hate and they're saying what more do you need than a blanket statement than that and I'm telling you now oh, what, what we're what I'm hearing back <laughs> from my five, list that's, that's a key part of that yeah. it well it yes. is a key part, but there seems to be some bit of denying going on on both extremes. So, so, and, so, but so they're so, saying, why is yeah, that ahead. not acceptable? Okay, so, 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 I mean, again, you have to put these things in context. So, uh, white supremacy is a theory and an ideological point of view that the United States was built on. This is a country that uh, inculcated into its founding documents the idea that people like Kim, both Kims and I uh, are not human, are three-fourths, three-fifths of uh, a human being. Uh, that ideal has been enforced through violence for 240 years, okay? There's no question about that. I mean, you, you go through uh, the, the run-up to the Civil War, the 100 years of Jim Crow that follow, the 50 years since where uh, we, we have still seen uh, this repeated uh, insistence that, uh, that equality is not going to, to, to be the way that we do things. That violence, uh, you, don't get to, you don't get to choose how the people who are the victims of that violence push back against it, right? If I push you down on the, on the ground and put my foot on your neck, I don't really get to decide how you get me 
off of you. And so the response to white supremacy, the response to Nazism, the response to the KKK and these other, uh, so these other are, groups. But, um, you, but I want to make it clear, you're condemning the violence on that side, right? Absolutely. Because I'm we saying, have this discussion, there's I'm, another group, there are folks that will leap to the other side and they're saying, well, if, if you're saying and in some cases it's okay or it's a national, natural progression, that you're somehow endorsing. What, I, what I'm saying is that, is that this is a violent country. This is a country that has violently oppressed entire groups of people for its entire existence. Mm -hmm. The idea that the pushback against that mm -hmm. violence, it, when it becomes violent, and it has, it has in the past, it's going to in the future, but the idea that those occupy the same moral space is one of the and most repugnant lies to that gets told. And uh, Stephen, you don't even have to go back 240 years because the person who organized this rally actually said that one of his major goals was to instill fear. He said that. That was a quote from his mouth. Of course, mind. now he's being so, labeled, and I'm not endorsing that either, as right. a former Obama supporter who is part of the deep state, yeah. and this was all a big conspiracy. Yeah. I do want to ask you one, but, one yeah, thing, but the, but the point it, I'm making is the reason, that's the reason that this, this rally took place. And I think that when we talk about the president of the United States framing it as a bunch of really nice people with a couple bad people maybe mixed <laughs> in, that is a very, very... But well, they are infuriated by this, and that is that there seems to be a double standard. That President well, Obama can, can look at a black nationalist killing five officers in Dallas, and this is the, the feedback I'm getting, uh -huh. and he doesn't call out black nationalists. Right. But somehow President Trump if the roles are reversed, has to name the Ku Klux Klan so, white supremacist. I need to speak but, but, but again, but again right. historically, there is, no comp there is no comparison between right. black nationalism and white supremacy. Black nationalism is a response to oppression. And it's also true... It isn't when they that, resort to violence, it, it, is, it is also true that there is, no, there is no ideology surrounding the idea of white inferiority that propels black nationalists uh, well, as a group. Philando still did not die okay, guys, because okay. of white uh, nationalists. These are absurd. We do have to take a, a commercial break. Lena, I will let you have the first word when we come back. Stay with us, folks. We've got more coming up. Discussion on the fallout from Charlottesville. And speaking of fallout, uh, we're just getting word as we record this show on Friday morning that Steve Bannon is out as White House chief strategist. So we'll have more on that uh, for sure as the week progresses. But uh, as I mentioned before we went to break, I was going to let Lena have the first word. And I know that uh, you've had an interesting week. Your Twitter account, uh, something has happened with that. You want to talk about that? Yes. And but before I before I share the statement that I've issued, I, I want to tell this panel something very important. The viewers that are watching this morning are hurting and we are a country that's deeply deeply divided but I believe that we fundamentally all want the same things we want freedom we want opportunities for our families we want safe schools we want to know that our job will be there tomorrow in a month in a week in a year we want to know that when our child's sick there'll be a doctor to go to or that we'll have the money for the copay this is what the people of Michigan are looking for mm -hmm. let's take the higher view here let's work together there we have more in common than we have differences as a Jewish woman with deep roots in the Jewish faith and a proud lineage of Jewish leaders and relatives who were killed in the Holocaust by blind hatred and prejudice. There is little that could be more offensive to me as by the suggestion that I like or I support David Duke, neo-Nazis, or any other group that promotes hate and prejudice. My, my Twitter account was hacked into on Thursday of last week. And in the short time that it was hacked, somebody had Lena Epstein liking neo-Nazi racism. We have stopped the attacks. We have, we have shut it down. But it just speaks to how crazy things are in our society right now, that a Jewish woman with proud Jewish roots would be attacked in, in this way. And I think it's important that Brandon Dillon, the chair of the Michigan Democrat Party, who has been per fueling these tweets and sharing them and sharing them and sharing them, that he know that he is talking to the wrong person about this issue. I am a proud Jew. I love Jewish people. I, I, I sit on six nonprofit Jewish boards. I'm from a strong family of Jews. This is terrible. Mm -hmm. This is it, not fair to the citizens of Michigan, and it, the facts and truth must be brought forward. It was well, I hope not as you. a Jewish woman you were offended that the President of the United States suggested that people who marched with neo-Nazis, with neo people who were carrying swastikas, people who were espousing the very ideas that led to the death of your relatives, 
um, are good people. I think that we are settled on the fact that Nazism is bad. I Did thought you, we were. But if you heard what I just said, that is an attack on all Michigan citizens, on the Jewish community, on the Republican Party, right. the party of Lincoln, for somebody to have done this, and for the Michigan Democrat Party chair to be fueling this right. is absolutely but beyond wrong. the partisan Please. politics, I yeah. hope that we can... But at what point right. do you have an obligation to stand up and say, this president is also doing those things, and he's doing those things uh, in, in the name of this Republican Party that you talk about. The party of Lincoln is nowhere near what it, what it was uh, in 1860 when, uh, when, when the war started, when he was elected and, and, and the war started. I mean, Republicans have refused to stand up against this kind of white supremacy for too long, and this president courted it during his campaign. He put white supremacists around him in the White House. He has enacted policies that further white supremacy, institutions uh, of white supremacy. So uh, at what point do you have an obligation to stand up against And you that? and I can disagree on a lot of what you just said. Because well, President uh, Trump is Those are facts, nothing. but... Uh, no, <laughs> President Trump... President Trump denounced white supremacy. He denounced white nationalism. After he denounced hours to think the KKK. Those are the facts. Okay, guys, I want to move on. Uh, Republican Senator Bob Corker, he came out on Thursday and questioned the president's competence, saying that he's not been able to demonstrate stability, um, that he doesn't have the competency to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that? And what does that mean for the Republican Party. What does it mean right. for uh, passing legislation? What, what does it, it means mean? It trouble for candidates like Lena Epstein because it, what we have now is a schism in the conservative ranks of the Republican Party. You've got establishment conservatives that are coming out and saying that the president needed to unequivocally call out white supremacists and white nationalists. Well, I, and, and then, mm -hmm. on the other side, you've got the Trump loyalists who are saying, well, he's a never Trumper. And even the establishment uh, pundits, the George Wills, the Charles Crowdhammers, uh, they're being labeled as right. elites. Well, it's, say, there's a schism ahead. there. As, as someone who's a proud Democrat, I feel, I don't even want, really want to talk about ideology because this is about something it's that's much right bigger. Mm -hmm. it, this is about the soul of America. Mm -hmm. We really have to think about it in those terms. And I think that, um, President Trump, um, whether he's competent or not, I believe that he's not, obviously. I have to say, as a, dem as a progressive, though, I feel really good about the fact that he has been completely unable to forward an agenda that I think is going to be anathema to the interests of our country. And at the same time, good. so uh, I, yeah. I, I feel horrible that we have a president who is incompetent, not intellectually curious, let's, but the, let's um, be a racist. Clear. I let's, don't feel good about yeah. any of that. But the one consolation prize that I have as a progressive is he can't get anything done. So okay. as an American, we are all enjoying a better economic experience as a result of a Trump presidency. All you have to do is look at housing markets, consumer confidence, the market did excuse me, week? the S&P overall has been extremely, extremely strong. Mm -hmm. Americans are enjoying a stronger economic experience. We have over a million jobs back to this country, reinvestment. So when I think about big picture, I see a results oriented uh, president. I'm very proud of that. But you're willing to take those results at the same time that this president, for instance, withdraws from consent agreements with police departments in places like Ferguson and Baltimore, where the police have for years been dragnetting black men uh, off of the streets, treating them as less than human, uh, back to that original idea in, in America, uh, through threats and violence. He says, we don't need consent agreements with those folks. He says, let's go investigate universities who are pursuing affirmative action, looking to diversify the campuses. We are at the lowest uh, level of African American presence at the University of Michigan in 30 years, uh, because there is no affirmative action. He says, let's, let's double down on that. Let's go, let's go find out uh, if they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Is anybody uh, else happy about the fact that we asserted ourselves as the international powerhouse my, of the world my last point is week? You're taking, Why are you're, we not you talking are, about you are taking those things over uh, these other things, and these other things are about you, Americans. You put words in my mouth. I'm well, not putting one over the other. I think well, it's important that we think about the big picture. But aren't both sides doing picture. that, Stephen? They're no. cherry-picking their issues not at all, to either Stephen. condemn or to glorify. And to Guy's point only, about the midterm election, that's we have... Point, that's why the dialogue's Can you tell happening. me about With a liberal... With the midterm you, a year away... With the midterm a year away, a lot is left to be seen. Can you tell I me about a liberal idea strongly. that advances the idea of white inferiority? Can you tell me about a liberal idea that says, let's make sure that 
white people don't have equal rights. I mean, again, well, I, I, again, the would tell you, look, again, the, the, the whole notion of white privilege are... is something that they find offensive. And well, yes, that is a liberal. Argument. I find white privilege offensive, too. But it's, I find the, the, the fact of white privilege, which, again, is found in those founding documents. This is not fiction. I mean, I don't have to sit here and, and say this is uh, as, as my opinion. This is what the country has been about and is still about. So the idea that, uh, again, I'm sorry, Stephen, I disagree with you. Is, you disagree with the Constitution? No, I disagree with the, this, I, this angry, angry feeling about us versus them. We are one no. United States, my friend. Well, we, we are. We were three-fifths we, we three of that. But this yeah. anger, when, I mean, when can we, this anger, this ire, this, I think I'm the sorry, anger, I, think I, don't, the anger, I don't agree with your well, perspective. I think the anger ends when the oppression ends, right? When we get to the space where a black life is worth the same as a white life. Every life matters. It, Every you life matters. You say that, I know you believe that. Okay, we can, America doesn't treat that. We can agree to disagree. Agree. Um, be, we are running low on time here, but before we go, I just I have one question for uh, all of you. It's been a crazy week. It's been a crazy seven months. Do you think the president will step down, resign? Just this past week, the ghostwriter for his book, Art of the Deal, came out and mm -hmm. said that he thinks the president is going to resign. What do you think about that, Stephen? Uh, I, I mean, I don't see. I mean, I think uh, you're dealing with a megalomaniac. Uh, kind of personality, it'd be really hard for me to get my mind around the circumstances that would say to him uh, to walk away, which would be admitting some sort of defeat. At the same time, I think this is someone who probably doesn't run for re-election in, uh, in 2020 uh, because he's going to be so frustrated by the things that he's not been able to do. Lena, your answer quickly. People call Donald Trump not a serious candidate. He's our president and he's fighting hard. We can disagree, but fundamentally need to treat each other with respect. President Trump is in this for the long haul. He'll be the president for the next seven years. Kim? Um, I doubt that he will resign because, as Stephen said, he is a megalomaniac. He is someone who does not have the best interests of this country um, at heart. And I, I think that he'll stay as long as we allow him to stay. And by we, I mean people in this country who love America enough to say this person is not fit to serve as president of the United States. Uh, one thing we know, this, this is a, a tough New York pugilist, okay? <laughs> he's tough. And so I don't think he's going to resign at all. I do think that um, it's going to be a really rocky couple of years, and we'll, we'll see. But, I mean, with the numbers that he's got right now, re-election doesn't seem dim. But with this candidate... You just We've learned never, never, never to say know. never, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and it, we do have this schism within the Republican Party, but you have to at least be encouraged, Kim, with the, the number of establishment re Republicans that have come out with their condemnation. We have to leave it there. Stay with us, folks. We'll be back to wrap it up. <laughs> All right, we have had a great discussion here on Flashpoint this morning, but we have to leave it where it is. Thanks for the discussion and a reminder, uh, we will all be looking at the sky tomorrow afternoon, so stay with WDIV for the uh, eclipse is excitement. Uh, we thank you at home for watching. Devin Skillion will be back with you next week. Have a great Sunday, everybody.